Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today is August 15th, 2024. And today on our call, we have the president, Corey Silver, and the EVP of sales, Elliot Samuel, from Eddie Smart Home Solutions. Eddie trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol EDY, and also trades on the OTC under the symbol ESHS. F. The company currently trades at $4 with 6 million shares outstanding or about a $24.5 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Thanks a lot, Trevor. Um, yeah, great to have Corey with us. Um, Trevor and I have had a couple of uh, conversations with Corey in the past. Um, we actually participated in the financing they did a little while ago, uh, but I was really intrigued by both the business model and the problem they solved. I can go into why a little bit later. But uh, real happy to have Corey here. Um, why don't we just uh, why don't we just dive right into it, Corey? You got a presentation. Welcome to our group. Uh, you know, I'm just going to let turn it over to you and let you go with it. Perfect. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Trevor. And so I'm I'm Corey Silver. I'm the president of Eddie Solutions. Elliot is our EVP of Sales and Business Development. So we'll dive into Eddie, but. To start, we're, we're, Eddie is a leading provider of leak mitigation technology in high-rise and mid-rise uh, buildings, mostly in Canada. And for those who don't know leak mitigation, it's a new and enormous opportunity that only exists today due to the new technology that allows for it and pressure from insurance companies to mitigate against this risk of water damage. So we're perfectly positioned to capitalize on this opportunity as we can bolt on our technology without changing the customer's behavior or design. And so I joined Eddie just over a year ago, and my focus was to improve free cash flow, simplify our offering, and to continue growth. So we continue to make small improvements every day. Uh, we completed an offering at the end of June. It closed July 2nd. I purchased uh, 460,000 shares in that offering. And I care about this because I'm so invested and the space is completely untapped and really fragmented in each market. So there's a huge opportunity for whoever gets this right. And we want that to be us and we're doing all the right things to make sure that's us. So why you should care about this, if you've had a water loss, you can understand how painful and expensive it can be. Property managers can't control costs due to water damage. Construction companies and developers have, have shutdowns of sites or cost overruns because of water damage and and insurance companies can't underwrite projects because of this. So it's a huge problem in the industry and we're the leaders in Canada and want to become the leaders globally in North America first. So that that's, that's Eddie in a nutshell and the opportunity. And so I'll take us through the, the disclaimer very quickly and and this is what we'll be going over today. So Elliot will take us through what is leak mitigation? How does Eddie do this? What does Eddie, what does Eddie do to solve leak mitigation? And then I'll take us through what is the opportunity and why is this opportunity so significant? So Elliot, if you want to take it away. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you guys for the opportunity here. Um, leak mitigation. It's a quite a loaded term. Uh, it's something that involves a whole number of stakeholders across real estate. Uh, and traditionally, without technology, it's really been on the individual to manage that process. It's been a collective of stakeholders from developers to constructors to uh, property managers, operators, and down to the residents who have that responsibility of putting together leak mitigation plans, everything associated. Where Eddie really comes into the picture is we help to extend those capabilities through technology, through platform that provides them with the data that they need in a really timely manner, backed by 24-7 central monitoring, because unfortunately data 
is great, but uh, it depends on whether people are actually looking at it or not. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, what we find is commercial environments require commercial systems and commercial services. And that's where Eddie comes into play in order to bridge that gap for those stakeholders and, and make sure that they have the best tools at their disposal in order to achieve those leak mitigation goals. Yeah, and as far as assets are concerned, I would say Eddie's, you know, penetrated multiple types of asset classes. We're probably mostly saturated in the multi-residential space. And that goes along with the risk factor associated in that space where you've got, you know, oftentimes hundreds of thousands of people living inside of a building, uh, using tons of fixtures, tons of water that's constantly being consumed all over the place for various systems. Uh, and that process doesn't just begin in the operating side of the cycle. It begins early on in construction and planning where you have people trying to deliver a project and they're just trying to cover their risk early on as well. Uh, so, you know, while we do focus heavily on, on the multi-residential space, plumbing is plumbing and it's probably the most pervasive force inside of all of these buildings, uh, whether it's hospitality, commercial, uh, ICI space, we've, we've seen a lot of growth in a lot of those markets and seeing a lot of major stakeholders as well, looking to establish standards for themselves today to be more efficient operationally and from an insurance perspective, and then looking to create those standards into the future so that they, they can have predictability in the outcomes of what happens in their environments. And, and these are all buildings that we're in right now, and we're in roughly 140 or so at the moment. Yeah, roughly 140, probably about uh, 100,000 plus devices across those. And so it's it's quite a bit of data that gets transferred across. And these are some of the key stakeholders that we see, you know, when you're putting a system in place in a commercial environment, it's going to impact a lot of different people. And not only that, you know, when you're dealing with people's jobs and what they're doing, a lot of what we're doing is really change management and working with these folks uh, and ensuring that they've got buy into these tools that they understand how they're used. And it really speaks to the fact that from the start of an asset life cycle all the way through uh, to the end of it, water is uh, a major issues. And just alone on the construction side, we've got amazing partners like uh, PCL Constructors as an example, who are using our tools in order to mitigate their risk on job sites, be better constructors. And it's really delivering down the line to all of the various trades and all of the various people who are operating in the environments down to the occupants where they're starting to receive value, whether that's uh, you know insurance benefit or just the peace of mind knowing that their home is safe. And here are some of our famous tools. So uh, as far as products are concerned, I'll run you through a fairly high level on the product suite, but starting over on the left side, we have our Eddie IQ, and this is really a, one of our flagship products, I happen to have one here in front of me and hopefully the blur doesn't take it out. Uh, but essentially it's an ultrasonic meter and built into that meter, there's an integrated shutoff valve. And the way that that device works is it's able to understand the flow of water down to practically less than a teaspoon worth of water. So we can catch really, really minor events to really major events through the use of our technology. And we learn on a consistent basis so that we're changing with changes in user behavior. And that gives us the ability to create automation. And there are so many different ways that we can apply that technology around buildings, depending on how people are trying to solve for it. Uh, people will use it for heating and cooling systems. They'll use it for non-potable water. They'll use it to just cover temporary water oftentimes during construction. And one of the major use cases is sub-metering companies across North America are using those meters to read, build, collect, uh, and remit for water usage inside of buildings while we end up facilitating unit level protection. And, and that creates a lot of efficiency. A lot of the theme of many of our devices, aside from maybe sensors and our, our gateway infrastructure, is this is capital that likely will be deployed by these you know, constructors, developers, and in, inside of these environments. And we don't really change people's design. We just simply enable it. And, and so as an example, you know, we have our IQ, which is able to provide all of that functionality and protect everybody, but there's limitations oftentimes in certain sets of data and, and certain devices, because as you start going larger, we need to change things a little bit. So if you look to the tile just to the right, uh, we have our Eddy link and our shutoff valves, which essentially is taking the concept of the IQ, but 
breaking it out into multiple pieces. Um, and so at a very basic level, the brains of the operation is the link, that device in the middle of the square. Uh, and that communicates directly with our actuators, our shutoff valves, and communicates that it's time to shut the water off or time to open it back up. Um, and it, the reason it's going to be able to do that is based on two potential things. One might be flow, where we are able to use these links and tie them into existing meters, about 95% of the meters in the marketplace. We can read the direct read from and be able to use that data for our benefit and for the, the benefit of the customer. Um, but oftentimes in larger systems, we'll rely more heavily on sensors because, you know, me telling you, well, you've got a problem somewhere isn't quite as valuable as me telling you exactly where that problem is and being able to get you there quicker. And I actually have a background in restoration, so I can tell you a major factor in the outcome of these events is how quickly do you get to the point where the issue is taking place? Um, and, and so we try to layer that into people's designs as opposed to having them change them so that they're not really adding an additional system, but rather adding utility to their current design. And so our valves will run from a half an inch up to 10 inches in size, which deals with the vast majority of the built environment. And we layer into that design. So again, we're not changing anything for the customer, not even changing their construction process. We're just enabling them further during all of the time where they bear that risk. Um, and like I was mentioning, sensors as data points are extremely, extremely key to what we do as an operation. Um, so as an example, I've got uh, an H2O sensor here in my right hand, and I actually have just in my left hand, my AirPod charger for those of you who are familiar for size and scale. Um, but it's a really intuitively designed product where even when it comes to our contacts, we try to ensure that the customer isn't experiencing false positives. So we take that into account during design. Um, and it's a th essentially a three-in-one sensor that has both, it has water contact and it also has humidity and temperature which we'll use in order to even drive predictive maintenance and, and be able to get people outcomes ahead of time before the water is present in certain cases like heating and cooling and within risers, areas where people aren't really sticking their heads into walls all the time. Um, and so they're wireless as well, which makes them really scalable and easy to maintain, use, install uh, right out of the gate. And wireless is actually one of the key factors as to why we are able to be so pervasive in this market and, and why we're able to be so successful is, is on the basis of the technology that we use actually. So what makes all of this possible, even having a long enough battery life on those sensors is to the tile to the right on the far side would be LoRaWAN technology. And that's a radio frequency network. And we utilize this type of technology, which is there to penetrate concrete and rebar and all of the insulating factors that these types of environments present. And in fact, it's very scalable so much so that a lot of cities are using them to create smart cities um, because they'll travel so far in terms of, of the signal. And that's what's really enabled these types of systems to come into the market and be more pervasive because historically, if you had to wire a system like this inside of a building and then maintain it long-term, it would be extremely ineffective from a cost perspective and an operational perspective. And so we can really thank a lot of the technological development for why this is starting to penetrate those environments because water by far and away is the largest risk inside of these environments. Just jumping forward to our next slide, at the most basic level, what we do is these three steps. We detect, we alert, and we act. And so at the very basis, everything comes down to data, those, those tools that you saw on the last page, which help us to get the data that we need in order to either make uh, an intelligent decision to automate immediately or to communicate where the potential risk is. And, and like mentioned, we might use sensors, we might use flow data in different environments in order to make those decisions. And from there, it goes to the next stage, which is alerting, right? Where we have to advise the customer what the issue is, what's taking place at that moment in time. And the first course of alert, we've got multi-factors on those alerts, but the first place that we start is we've got a dashboard, which they have access to. Um, we also have, uh, you know, a, an application, which they have access to and can receive push notification from. They receive text messages, but the biggest key is actually the 24 seven call center. 
Um, and like I was mentioning before, these are commercial environments, whether it's multi-residential or if it's an office or a hospital. And, and inside of those environments, they require commercial service. And that's one of our major differentiators and a major X factor for why we can deliver what we do on a consistent basis. Um, and then the final part of that is action. We have, we have to act, we have to isolate. Uh, and, and so sometimes customers, uh, like you might hear on the, in an upcoming call, uh, customers may have business rules which indicate they just want to be notified. They want to be able to be alerted, investigate, and take action, and we'll guide them through that process. Other times, customers want immediate action and then go and investigate. But regardless of the environment and the business rules, we're able to work really closely with our customers to give them what they need so that the service functions and it's not burdensome for them. Um, I'm just going to actually demonstrate that right now. And like, this is really the the importance of a call center managing it. And for those of you who've ever been in a loss environment before, uh, while it's going on, it's quite chaotic. Uh, you know, some people are looking for the valve. Who knows the last time it was turned? They're calling the plumber at the same time, trying to get the restoration company on, on board. And uh, they, at the same time, they got to deal with managing a building. So this is a great example of just how we de-escalate those situations and manage it from top to bottom. Hello, this is Ram Radi Solutions. We received an alert from the water sensors today, located from the mechanical room, 22nd floor uh, behind air unit. Okay, yeah, I'm just running up the stairs right now. I saw the email come through. Hi, it's calling from um, I'm up here on 23. Is there any way that you can shut the water off? Yeah, or 22, I mean. Okay, sure. Um, what was the cause of the leak? Uh, it's coming out of the backwash station. Uh, the pressure is slowly turning off. Okay. okay. We've got less uh, pressure now. We still have flow, it's just less now. Oh, the water stopped. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hang on one second. Yeah, the water's off. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Yeah, so that that's a great sample of what service delivery looks like. And another key thing is a lot of vendors are going to show you these fantastic dashboards and lovely data. And the reality is this: nobody wants another dashboard to look at. Uh, nobody wants another system to manage. What they want is they want the value of the service. They want the action when they need it and they want the data curated when they need it. And even beyond this call, which takes place, that would be followed up with then a report outlining all of the details of the alert, all the details of the event, which took place, allowing for that operator not to have to focus on collecting those things and focus on the next step, which is managing the building and getting back to where it needs to be. Um, and that's really, uh, you know, a very, high level overview of what we're sort of doing on, on on that end as it relates to service and action but i can't underscore it anymore service is the key we're uh those devices anybody can go and buy devices off of amazon or off of the internet and try to utilize them but at the end of the day where property technology fails in commercial environments is a lack of engagement management and oversight and we take care of those processes for our customers so that they get the benefits without having to deal with, you know, the heavy load of trying to carry that system. Thank you, Elliot. That was great to see the product walk through. And I'm going to take us through the team and the opportunity. And uh, and so, really, I'll I'll focus on Mark Silver, our CEO, executive chair, who's also my father and a serial entrepreneur. So uh, his most notable company that he built and founded was Direct Energy, which he sold to Centrica British Gas in 2001 for $912 million. Uh, after his non-compete was over, he started a company called Universal Energy, which he sold to Just Energy for $400 million. And he stayed on there. Uh, that was in 2007, 2008. He stayed on there as CEO of uh, a home service company, National Home Services, which in 2014 sold for $505 million. So he's got an incredible track record. 
And it's the same time that the opportunity for Eddie had come up. Someone approached him with this, the idea for leak mitigation in the single family home space. And he thought it was the next, the next space that needed to be revolutionized. And he's been working at it ever, ever since. We've got a great board of directors as well. All of them participated in the offering. So we've got a really invested board. And uh, one of those directors is Chris Gower, who's the deputy CEO of PCL, who's the largest constructor in Canada and the seventh largest constructor in North America. So I won't get into everyone else, but it, I couldn't be happier with the team that we've built. And we know we're offering the best solution and the best product. And so it's taken a long time, but, but uh, really the first several years were focused on single family home. And it wasn't until we focused on commercial mid-rise, high-rise that we started to see tremendous success. And that's because in a single family home, if you have a leak, it's your basement or your house that's impacted. If you have a leak in a mid-rise or high-rise building, it's your 20 neighbors' homes as well that are below you. So in 2021, when we went uh, public at the end of the year, so we went public 2022, but at the end of the year 2021, we had 30,000 devices installed. That was 40,000 or 42,000 in 2022. We had tremendous growth, 77% between 22 and 23 with 75,000 devices. And we've already passed 100,000 devices this year. And that's relevant because each device represents recurring revenue for us. And, and so that recurring revenue is about $40 on an annual basis. And so we're getting recurring revenue. We'll have upfront capital revenue with some of the new processes that we've, we've implemented. So it's a strong business now that's got a combination of hardware and recurring revenue. And we couldn't have done this without our partners and our customers, who include some of the largest uh, developers in, in Canada, Pemberton, Bosa Out West, uh, Four Seasons. Uh, there's also UCLA, the college campus in California, and uh, our construction partners like PCL and Ellis Don, as well as insurance partners. So. We're protecting over 40,000 units, have 100,000 devices in the field, and every single day we're detecting a leak on, on these properties, which is in turn is adding value to the occupant or the constructor and to our proposition. So since, since I joined Eddie with the focus on cash flow, uh, we reduced GNA, we increased revenue, we haven't hit profitability, but we've hit our first uh, cash flow positive quarter. And we will continue to, we plan to continue to, to keep this trend going. And with the offering that we completed, we'll no longer have to be servicing our debt. So we'll have $700,000 of debt that we don't need to service any longer and some working capital to continue to grow and do what we've doing, been doing and remain the leaders in this space. And so the, ne the next slide is, is more balance sheet. And this isn't a badge of honor that there have been $60 million of losses today. It is a badge of honor that we're mitigating that now, we're getting to profitability. And it just goes to show, A, there's value in there, but it's very difficult to build technology in the space. And all our proprietary, te proprietary technology has allowed us to service 100,000 suites and 100 plus buildings. So this is a space that's going to be massive. And we've invested the time, money, and effort to get past that uh, proof of concept phase and into that uh, becoming the leader in, in Canada and, and in, in the US, it's, it's extremely fragmented. So there is no clear leader. And so again, we completed that $8 million private placement. Uh, March 31st, we had six and a half million dollars of debt outstanding. That's since been paid off and we've rationalized our expenses to be in a much stronger position. And this is more, I, I've talked about how huge this opportunity is, but I think this really goes to show how, how big it is. 75% of this is avoidable with our technology. So it's, it's a, an issue that doesn't have to exist. $5 billion of course of construction losses, $13 billion in operational buildings. And that doesn't have to be an issue. And that's why insurance companies are starting to mandate that the developers and constructors put in this kind of technology into their buildings. And it's also why 
Chris Gower at, at, at CEO. From top down, we've got buy-in to start deploying Eddie in more of their sites. Elliot, we've probably deployed at 20 PCL sites today. I'd say 20, but with the advent of some of the automation tools, our expectations are going to be a lot more a lot more penetration within their uh, portfolio over the coming year. Yeah. And so being the largest developer or constructor in Canada and the seventh largest in the U.S., once they've bought into their technology, which took a long time, but now that they have, it's really the sky's the limit for that opportunity. And as constructors see PCL doing this, who are, are leaders and in, in incredible in the construction industry, they'll they'll start buying in as well. So it's just an industry that isn't used to technology and someone has to be the first to adopt it. And PCL has been that uh, first to adopt it. Elliot, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to make a note on those financial metrics there on the slide before, because ultimately what you're looking at there anyway was just claimable losses. And when I speak to most of these general contractors, most of these customers on the other end, the vast majority of their actual benefit is out of pocket where they're carrying risk packages up to a quarter million, half a million in terms of their deductible numbers, which really means they're they're out of pocket insured for the losses below there if they don't want to make a claim. And that's where we also drive a ton of bottom line value to those guys, because instead of having to deal with the, them spending extra off their balance sheet, never mind making a claim and dealing with all the delays on the back end, they're avoiding those 20, 30, 40, 100,000, $150,000 losses that wouldn't even be claimable, right? Yeah, so that's on this slide. These are just what was claimed by the insurance company. So there's there's far more below that or before that that isn't getting claimed. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And so in terms of next steps, we want to continue to grow organically with our developers. Uh, we're going to build on our partnership with PCL for North American expansion, bolster our service business, uh, and... And really, we want to bolster our service business because it means additional revenue as we're servicing buildings, as well as more referrals. We've seen the more engaged the building is, the more likely they are to refer us to the property manager next door. And we've been seeing more and more business like that. So, so it's been a great, uh, great new initiative that we've rolled out. And then consider acquisitions and strategic partnerships. The space is really fragmented with no clear leader and and we we'd be it's it's difficult because these the others aren't public, but we should have more devices deployed than almost any other competitor out there. Elliot, could you uh, speak to that? Uh, I, I would I would say that it's very very likely just on the way that we operate relative to most other folks because just in terms of the types of systems that we design, we're focused on their actual building design and their actual liabilities. Uh, alongside insurance requirements that are sort of put out into the market to meet a minimum threshold of risk. And I, I think that's what's partially aided us in, in having, you know, so many devices in the field um, because we're covering where people actually have their real risks and, and making sure that we're providing an effective solution. And, and then being so early to the game has given us these long-term relationships with insurance partners who now recommend edit. And so when when others are looking for solutions, that's the CFO calling now. When others are looking for solutions, we're we're there to 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 handle it. We're there to provide solutions. And so next steps, there isn't much volume with the stock right now. That's why it's fluctuating as much as it is. I uh, but I'd say add Eddie to the watch to your watch list. Review our earnings. Q two is coming up at the end of August, and. Uh, review the earnings after that because we're we're looking to continue to build on the success and then request to be added to Eddie's IR list. And so you can do that on our website as well. And that's that's uh, all we've got. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you, Trevor. And yeah, we'd love any questions that, that you perfect. have. Perfect, perfect, Corey. Awesome. Um... Well, I think he, he did a great job in sort of giving a sense of uh, the technology and kind of the, the problems you solve. Um, the you, You've got a fantastic list of clients, uh, some that I certainly rec uh, recognize and a few that I've actually worked for in the past. Um, but uh, you, you, you've you actually got a fair bit of visibility going forward as well. Um, I know when we spoke last, you've got a sizable backlog. I don't know how you want to categorize the backlog, but maybe let's talk to that a little bit. 
tell us about sort of the, the visibility you guys do have going forward. Yeah, so in terms of uh, executed contracts, we've got $38 million of executed contract revenue to still come in over the term. That's on our existing revenue. And then our backlog is based on the development cycle of all of these developers. And it would be about the same. Elliot, we were talking before this call, how, how much have we quoted uh, year to date? And, and that'll give you a sense of the opportunity. Like There's a lot of business coming to us organically because we've been planting seeds for, for all of these years. Yeah, I think year to date, just on capital alone, we're near $40 million quoted year to date. And then on the back end on OPEX, it's closer to around a million dollars worth of OPEX costs on a monthly. So uh, it's quite significant uh, in terms of what we have upcoming in our, our pipeline. And, you know, a lot of that is, like Corey mentioned, predicated on word of mouth, predicated on doing a good job in the past and having customers come back and, and want to create those standards and, and build it out for years to come. So. Mm -hmm. And do we have a sense of what the addressable market is maybe just in Canada? Like how many, how many, you know, buildings, I guess, uh, are either being built right now or even these retrofits or, or you know, the, the clients that you can actually address with, how many, how many units are out there? You've got a hundred thousand devices deployed. Um, how many devices could you deploy into, into Canada? Elliot, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Hey, Corey, if you want to start, I'll, I'll finish. Okay. So again, any building, any high rise or mid rise building is an opportunity. They all have this risk. So really every, every commercial building or multifamily building, whether it's 40 years old, where it's got significant old, older pipes and significant risk, or it's a new construction where they've got new water coming into a building they've never operated those are those are the that's the addressable market and and it's it's likely over over half a million units that we could be capitalizing on on an annual basis and, and that's based on some of the sub metering data that we're getting from our partners who are able to capitalize on that market within canada and yeah, in canada alone there's over 15 million residential buildings with around 4.96 multifamily homes like you're, you're talking about a crazy amount of volume but when you compound that with the power of our partnerships where you have people on board like pcl who are addressing billions of dollars of construction on a yearly basis and have a huge amounts of risk to manage on that side mm -hmm. it opens up so much more addressable market and also opens up uh, a scalable way to grow without trying to over overspend at the at the outset so we really try to take that philosophy on and, and grow with our partners in the right time uh, mm -hmm. and grow to scale rather than scale to grow and and so that's really what's been bringing us along along with that many of our insurance relationships are starting to accelerate quite strongly and that drive in that market is is beginning to be more accepting across the board, whether it's through incentive or whether it's mm -hmm. through mandate by the underwriters. A lot of them are starting to to have enough underwriting data to make that decision mm -hmm. and to begin implementing not just standards like saying, hey, you got to have leak protection, but saying we need to meet these specific standards so that we can actually mitigate the risk that you're experiencing because it's, it's so concentrated. Your answer was more eloquent than mine. I, I, we've got to... <laughs> half a million that I believe can be addressed very easily. But yeah. Elliot's right. It's the entire market that is is uh, looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and give us a sense, I know it may be possible to tell, but how much how much of the market is penetrated? Like how much of the addressable market is still available on a percentage basis? It's barely even scratched yeah. the surface of that marketplace because most of the addressable technology that you're even talking about is earmarked for development. The vast majority right. of inventory is in existing infrastructure and buildings across North America. Mm -hmm. And that market alone in and of itself represents huge opportunities. And again, we're, we're positioned beautifully because we have phenomenal partnerships with service organizations mm -hmm. who are providing active service for decades to these buildings which leads to great opportunities for us to build value for them as organizations, build more mm -hmm. service value for those people inside of their buildings. And from an addressable market perspective, I'd say there, there's no limitation. People definitely need more homes. That mm -hmm. much is for sure. Yeah, no, we know that for sure. Um, 
Maybe, maybe one more question on the technology. Uh, IP, you mentioned um, anything patented, anything, you know, is it is it secret sauce type of stuff or, nothing, or what, nothing, what is really? Yeah. Nothing patent, patentable, really. The secret mm -hmm. sauce is, is in having those 40,000 units and 100,000 mm -hmm. devices. It's so difficult to get to this stage because, again, especially in new construction where we see a lot of opportunity, you're three, four years out by the time you sell it, and then you're three, four years out before your, your technology is being deployed, and even further out before you're actually providing value to the unit owner. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's... I wouldn't say patentable, but I would would definitely say that there's some unique technology behind as far as learning is concerned, mm -hmm. as far as the effort and time and challenges that we've encountered slamming our mm -hmm. heads across the wall for, for the better part of a decade at this mm -hmm. operation to get it to the point where, uh, you know, it is today mm -hmm. and to get it to the point where from a communication perspective, like I think I mentioned before, that's one of the, the biggest elements behind it is reliability, right? Because mm -hmm. people are counting on you to deliver yeah. uh, all the time. And there's no there's no days off. There's no moments mm -hmm. off of that. Um, and so communication is really key. But it's that combination of having the right tools in place because, mm -hmm. you know, the right tool in the wrong hands does the wrong thing. But having the right tool in place and having the right team in place to manage it is I think the real secret sauce. So I'd almost say it's like we're a, a, a service company masquerading as a technology company mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what people really crave. Sure. Yeah, they just want the problem fixed. They uh, want yeah, the problem in the of, easiest yeah. way possible. And, and yeah. we've seen competitors come and go in this space and it's so difficult to solve this problem. Yeah, yeah, like yeah gotcha. Know. Gotcha. Now you mentioned that you, it's sort of two, two components here. You sell hardware and then you collect uh, sort of ongoing revenue from monitoring. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of margins you get on the hardware and um, yeah, I guess um, yeah, margins, I guess on, on the data stream or on the, the monitoring side, maybe, maybe talk to that a little bit as well. So conservatively it would be uh, about 50% on the hardware side. Uh, and 80% on the monitoring side. Perfect. Perfect. So highly, highly effective here. Um, okay. That's awesome. Um, have you, uh, <clears throat> you got a sense of what, what your revenue level has to be at to, to break even? So I'd say if you're reviewing our financials, looking at our deferred revenue is a better metric to consider because any equipment that we sell, we have to capitalize over the useful life of the equipment. And the term of the con or the term of the contract. So right. again, I we're I can't get into cash receipts, but we're in a very good position now in terms of what's coming in and what's going out. And that'll also be seen in our, our cash flow from operations. Mm -hmm. So okay. Yeah. Gotcha. 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 Okay. I I, I think I, I know how to to to, to sort of uh, capture that. Um Okay, yeah, so if you look deferred revenue additions, you'll see really yeah. what our what our non IFRS uh, revenue is today, which right. is very close to where we need to be. Yeah. What's the typical length of the contract then? Is it five years? I, our average is is five and a half years. So okay, five and a half we've years. We've got some okay. some construction projects that are only uh, twenty four months, but the average developer contract is seven years. Right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Good. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, percentage ownership by insiders. I know you guys have a significantly high percentage. What would give, give us a sense of the breakdown of the shareholder base? Yeah, so you've got Mark as CEO. Uh, PCL owns almost ten percent, nine point nine nine percent, and they're insiders because of uh, Chris on the board, or mm -hmm. the, the published because of Chris. Uh, the board members would total another six or seven percent, mm -hmm. and then Mark holds uh, forty-four percent. Okay. So Sorry. you you've got a, a very committed board and ownership group that's put their money into this yeah. opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I comment. I mean, in the financing you did was actually what I would say. Uh, shareholder respectful. Um, you guys really gave opportunity to everybody who was existing shareholders to be able to participate in the you know, called the down round that was done here. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. And and, yeah. and we wouldn't 
again, we'd, we'd only be looking to raise raise money if we saw a very creative opportunity in acquiring a group in, in the US or Canada. Mm -hmm. So if that opportunity came up, came up, I think that's when we'd look at raising next. But we wouldn't want to do that at the down round for the initial uh, yeah. initial investors, the yeah. public, which was at uh, the equivalent of seven dollars today. Yeah. yeah. And and listen, I mean, that was sort of my next question is is around M and A. Are there M and A opportunities for you guys uh, out there? Yes, there's a lot because of how difficult the space is and how much money you've seen it take. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunity for M and A. Where a lot of potential optionality as it relates to that because of how many different stakeholders touch our technology, mm -hmm. and how it can mm -hmm. line up with their business model. Anybody looking to drive recurring revenue into their model, anybody looking to add service value that's operating in the real estate infrastructure business. There are so many stakeholders that have so much vested that mm -hmm. they could be phenomenal partners on that end. Mm -hmm. Understood. Understood. Um, so apart from M&A though, uh, if, if you had, if somebody dropped another $5 million in your lap, what do you, what do, you do with X, any sort of excess capital? I, we don't need the excess capital today, okay. which is a nice position to be in. I, what we've got to figure out is really how to sell into the retrofit market more effectively, because that's mm -hmm. that's where the bulk of the opportunity is. But I think that comes with the course of construction, the the, the constructor market. So really, we're just focused on the course of construction, building out that market. And we see the retrofit opportunities coming in as we're doing this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. really, we don't have a, a need today of 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 five million dollars or, or mm -hmm. whatever the number may okay. be, which is which is good. Okay, good. No, that's definitely good to know. Um, remind everybody that's listening, if you get a question you'd like me to ask uh, the guys here, please uh, use the chat function and uh, and I'll ask. I see we've already got some questions lining up, so I'll, I'll get to those in a second. Um, uh, like, how, 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 if anything, do you grow faster? I mean, I'm sure you're, you're poking everything you can right now, but is there, is there something that could speed it up? I know insurance companies are starting to push this more and more, but is there any other things that you can see outside your control that could help speed up this process? Fostering that relationship with PCL will really help us to grow. And, and then at that point as we're growing so quickly that we need to be buying more equipment. Mm -hmm. Potentially yeah. we have a need for capital then, but I, I, I think the way we're capitalized and the way our payment terms line up we wouldn't need it in those instances. So we can we can scale. But to answer both questions, it's, it's PCL. Really, if we can get their buy-in, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to uh, be extremely successful just on, on that basis alone and continuing to do a great job with our existing customers. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that as well, that I think the insurance relationships are a massive, uh, a massive part of that scale up as well as insurance companies begin to enforce more rig rigorous mm -hmm. standards across mm -hmm. the board in all forms of environments. And as those efficiencies start to proliferate to all of the other stakeholders like mechanical contractors and engineers and anybody involved in these projects uh, where they're able to gain efficiencies on on what they're doing in business, mm -hmm. that's, that's where we'll start to see uh, a quite a significant amount of uptick. And I, I think even further to Corey's point with respect to PCL and with some of these organizations who are getting involved in projects at extremely early stages, pre-bidding mm -hmm. years and years before, I think we've laid out many of the conditions and over the last 12 months or so under Corey's stewardship, we've, we've done a lot to reformulate the business modeling to allow for it to be scalable and automated in many different places so that we can give our customers those tools to get the information faster, earlier, and mm -hmm. not create scope creep later on in projects, not create those challenges mm -hmm. that happen when you try to introduce things post-budget. And so I think that that's going to be a major factor in, in some of our growth as we work with our partners, but partners mm -hmm. are the lifeblood of, of, of yeah. how and, we grow. And I mentioned PCL because they're top of mind and we have mm -hmm. weekly calls with them. And so they're extremely engaged, but it could be any of our customers who decide, mm -hmm. any of our constructors who decide we've got to roll this out everywhere and yeah. and it'll be a tremendous. And let's not forget our sub-metering partners who are extremely, and our sub -metering partners. extremely important yeah. uh, as, yeah. as part of 
financial engineering as part of a lot that we do together with customers to make sure that they can receive technology and maintain because yeah. these are challenging times in real estate and people need to yeah. maintain the you know a proper balance so having that correct approach and, and ensuring that we can be responsible on those projects is, is extremely mm. Mm, that's cool um last question sort of before we jump into some of the listener questions just i'm trying to get a sense of uh what um like how do you scale and like if you were to double the size of your business what other resources or people would you need to be able to get there we'd need additional sales support for sure additional admin mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the back end we're in, in very great shape right now manufacturing partners there's no concern there at all so just because we've been around for so long we have great relationships with our manufacturing partners who know us know our product mm -hmm. and that's something you wouldn't have have right away so really it's it's sales support mm -hmm. and then operationally the these the, the system can be installed by the client directly mm -hmm. or we can we can handle that installation as well so we're giving that optionality, so mm. we potentially need additional manpower or resources to to conduct the installation. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I, partnership, I, with, you know, some some organizations yeah. that can help us. Yeah, that. PCL as an example is installing all of the devices. Okay. Themselves. Okay. Okay. Sites. Okay. Good. Good to know. And then um, I, I imagine, like from the monitoring side, most of this has got to be automated. Um, you know, something something goes wrong. There's an alarm going off somewhere. So it's not like somebody's physically watching a screen or no, physically it's, watching something. Right? It, it's all automated, but yeah. then to make those phone calls isn't right. So we need to hire uh, additional CS staff. Okay. Calls, but yeah. it's it's marginal. In, in yeah, that. yeah, and that's what I keep thinking is that the monitoring side, there's got to be tremendous scale there. Um, you know, one yeah. person probably can handle a lot of of customers. If if I Yes. think of it correctly yeah 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 okay, and we need to do more on top of that to make sure that we don't overload our call center we have our version of a customer success manager that's like a building success manager that works as that building's advocate to help them manage and maintain and service the solution right. Right. so there's always that interplay and consistent engagement and communication um, but yeah like like you heard in that phone call it wasn't the notification on the email that got that property manager up to the area what it was is the phone call yeah it, it, walking them through the process because they're sure. not alone and it yeah. makes it uh, still need yeah. a human touch yeah yeah no i fully understand that okay so let's jump on to some questions um i uh, love it when uh our, our listeners are uh, engaged in, in asking these couple questions uh we've got hassan says devices are wireless does it need to be connected to the internet no uh, it's a sorry go ahead elliot you'll you'll answer uh you'll answer more nicely than i i do i'm shorter <laughs> than you are no worries yeah no we do not rely on uh the existing connection inside of the building we create our own captive network uh through the use of those gateways that we were talking about a bunch of slides back uh, and so we basically will create our own network inside of the building uh, and we'll communicate oftentimes to get our data back to the cloud through a cellular chip that'll be located at one of the stations. Uh, and that will allow us to do our analysis in the cloud and then take action on the front end. So that's how we connect, but we don't rely on external systems because mm -hmm. that's you not can't. robust enough yeah, for us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I can understand that. Um, okay, there's a comment rather than a question. It says, uh, Jennifer says, this sounds awesome. I found out last week that a friend of the family had a leak in her apartment that caused 10,000 plus dollars in damage to her neighbor's apartment. She is on the hook for paying the damage and has no money. Uh, so clearly, stuff like this uh, can mitigate a lot of that, that type of issue. Well, it's a yeah. huge thing and depends on where people live because different corporations will have different policies where you can't mm -hmm. subrogate across units sometimes. And we've started to see an actual trend now where in different provinces and different territories, people are now required to carry deductible insurance mm -hmm. as an additional policy coverage in the event, not, never mind if it goes into someone else's unit. This is just yeah. if there's a deductible that needs to be paid on the building. And so now you're starting to see individuals carry the risk for the whole building incorporated. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and the costs are rising. The insurance costs are yeah. rising. The cost of water damage is becoming increasingly more expensive. So it, it's it's an issue that, that isn't going anywhere. 
Yeah, no, fully understood. Uh, okay, Cocoon uh, asks, what kind of margins does Eddie have on the $40 of annual recurring revenue per device? So you mentioned 80%. So the, yeah. the, the data piece is roughly 80%. Yeah, right? and, and and so that's a, a blend of our of our equipment and our recurring. So the, the mm -hmm. margin there is closer. Our last quarter was 43%. Mm -hmm. But with some of the changes we've made, separating out equipment and monitoring, it'll be, it'll be our margin. Mm -hmm. uh, should improve. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you ever? Uh, maybe you're doing it already, but do you ever look at a sort of a hardware as a service type of model where it's all there, there's no upfront cost, but they're paying a higher amount on a monthly basis? We we've considered it, and and it mm -hmm. could allow us to grow much faster. I just don't think we're at that point today mm -hmm. where if we start charging zero dollars, yeah. we we sell like hotcakes. So again, that comes when the insurance companies really are are are. Our, mandating our doors and, and yeah. mandating it and i think yeah. it's going to be the insurance company who's saying we're willing to a you'll get lower premiums and b will subsidize the cost of right. whatever you decide to put in which yeah makes makes sense yeah 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 you can see something like that um okay so jennifer asks is there any concern about eddie's liability if the technology fails to detect a leak or fails to turn off the water no, we're we're well covered in terms of our service team. So because because our service team is constantly telling the sites what's offline, what isn't going on, that helps to mitigate our liability as well as the contracts don't allow for it. But I, I'm not one to go back to the contracts. I think it's better just if they've got a device offline, which happens, we're communicating with them. A on the dashboard and then B with the service team through mm -hmm. monthly connectivity reports saying, here's what's going on. If you've got a risk, like you've got a risk here if you mm -hmm. don't call us in for service. Correct. Gotcha. And one other factor to add in there is that there is no silver bullet for leak detection. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, our goal is to mitigate the risk and the outcomes of those events, right? Mm -hmm. And whether an event is occurring in the building, the reality is, Generally speaking, Eddie is not going to be the cause of that event. We'll be a tool to help mitigate the outcome mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes there's that attribution where people will say, oh, well, the system needs to be perfect 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And we, we feel that because we're the service provider on the other end, for sure. But at the end of the day, more of the time, they're thankful because we're still wrapping up more data for them mm -hmm. as part of the file so that they're not left with three different contractors pointing fingers in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And by the time they're done with the auditors and lawyers, they're, they're lucky to recover 50%. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, that's great. Uh, okay. So Dave, Dave asked a, a number of questions here. We've got, uh, does Eddie perform the installations or is it subcontract out uh, in a retrofit? Great question. And it's a combination. So we'll give the option to complete the install on each of the projects that were mm -hmm. awarded. Mm -hmm. But what we do make mandatory is project management. That's something that okay. we have to do on every project in order to ensure the success of the project. Yeah. Uh, whether they want another trade to physically install devices as opposed to us is up to the client's you know, mm -hmm. discretion. Yeah, and, and to the earlier point, if we're not there project managing, we we can't know that everything is done properly. And, right. and yeah, 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 gotcha. Um, what, what, what would, what sort of the average upfront cost let's say a 50 unit building what kind of what kind of upfront cost does a building like that have to incur like i'm trying to think from the decision maker's point of view what what kind of check is he going to have to write to to get something like this in there i'll, I'll let you take that I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one okay i i think it comes down to two two major factors one what are the goals for that mm -hmm. person in that 50 unit building because the deployment can be very minor case like i just want to have a couple of sensors in a few mm -hmm. places and shut water off on my main mm -hmm. to i'd like to shut off every single unit and i'd like to do x y and z right? right and so dependent on the type of deployment that somebody's looking at there's obviously going to be a lot of variance um but what i would say is if you're looking at it from a percentage of a project where our sort of sweet spot is anywhere below about point point one to point five percent project value is where people look oftentimes to say okay this is responsible for me to implement this technology because my risk 
like we're talking about. If, if you're thinking about it from a risk perspective, average deductible on builder's risk alone for water is $250,000 in the market for first loss. Second loss is $500,000. So when they're contemplating a system, they're out of pocket essentially for just 500,000 because they don't want to make that first claim unless it's mm -hmm. well above that because they're, they're it's going to damage their insurance profile and it's also going right. to leave them having higher rates. So you can justifiably look at most of these projects and say, you can spend up to a half a million dollars and you're reducing your risk significantly because even when you look at the incentive side from the insurance company, let's say we end up getting 10% discount on that $250,000. It'll take them about four minutes to generate $25,000 worth of water damage inside of that building. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all comes down to the core case of what are you trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, balancing out that financial side with, yeah. with those goals. Yeah. And, and you, you couldn't get a system for under $25,000 in all likelihood, just with the network and everything. Mm -hmm. But we've seen upwards of seven, eight hundred thousand dollar job. Wow. Wow. Sizable that definitely. Um and, and do your do any of your competitors offer monitoring services? Is, is that the way your competition kind of operates as well? No. The, they, they don't none of our competition have the call center as far as we we know. And mm -hmm. it's a, a huge differentiator. It's difficult to set up, obviously. It's just mm -hmm. a, a business on its own. But once it's there, it's it's, it's amazing. Uh, but you couldn't do it if you didn't have if you didn't have a hundred thousand sensors mm -hmm. in the field that you were monitoring. Last night we had four leaks that were detected. Mm -hmm. Each one of them got a phone call, and that's a regular occurrence. So oh. again, we're we're the we're the really providing a, a full full solution to the building yeah. where it's we're not just shipping you sensors and saying okay. Now you're yeah. on your own. You're, you're going to get, get a text message, and when the concierge mm -hmm. turns over, like, mm -hmm. good luck. So, yeah, we're we're the only ones doing this right now. Mm -hmm. the level that we are. So, gotcha. Yeah, that, that's amazing. When when you put in context, like the the water damage I've seen in some high rise buildings, I mean, for those we're talking close to a million bucks worth of damage. Um, that 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 numbers can be staggering. So. You, you basically saved four major issues, it sounds like. So it's, it's pretty cool. And and uh, those those four mm -hmm. issues were, some were minor, some were major. Sure. But it could be as simple as, usually, hopefully we get it as we've detected water on the floor yeah. behind the walls, send the property manager up. But that could have been a mold issue. It could have seeped down to the four or five units below. But yeah, mm -hmm. we're detecting issues daily at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things on the ROI side there is because it's like, how do you prove a negative when right. you stop something really quickly that yeah. uh, I can tell yeah. you that in that loss you guys heard on the phone without sensors in place, without isolation and monitoring, that's at least a couple million dollars coming yeah. from a penthouse because, you know, that's up there on the top of the building. By the yeah. time someone sees it, you've got a waterfall coming down the stairs and I can tell <laughs> you my restoration days, there's so much water weight against that door, you yeah. can't even open it. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. that. That's why I've got a big smile on my face. I've seen the waterfall. So, um, well, I mean, there's a question on ROI, but maybe uh, frame it around, you know, obviously uh, insurance, right? Um, is there is there an ROI just on the insurance component? You, you, you know, you're, well, you sort of talk to first, first claim and things like that, but are insurance companies offering uh, deductions uh, on this technology? Or are we at that point yet? So, it Elliot, what the, I, I, yeah, what's AXA doing? Because I think that's the most uh, that's the most concrete. And then we could get into single family home, which has adopted more rebates where they're paying uh, an installation allowance for customers to do this. But that hasn't happened yet on the commercial side. Yeah. Tr traditionally, on the commercial side, you get the, the stick while consumers get the carrot. Um, and so what that means is more enforcement of standards at the outset. So. If you want to be underwritten for builder's risk, you're going to have to put a solution in place that meets these basic standards. And on top of that, you'll get some incentive for it. But a lot of a lot of underwriters, like guys like Northbridge, are saying we're not going to underwrite that builder's risk unless you have a certain level of protection. Uh, on the other side, you got folks like AXA who are 
pushing that technology and they're the largest property and casualty underwriter in North America. They're, they're heavily focused on building out strong ecosystems and water is the most pervasive threat across their entire portfolio. So when, when they're looking at things like that, they're trying to figure out how do we get this to proliferate from construction into operating and make sure mm -hmm. all the underwriting groups have enough data to, to say, hey, maybe it's worthwhile to start covering the cost of these systems just because our file size is large enough. Mm -hmm. like, if you look at the average course of construction loss near and where they bear that larger risk is really closer to substantial completion on the projects and nearer to turnover because you have mm -hmm. a lot of finishes in place. I think average loss is somewhere like $450,000. And that's like a small, very nothing loss mm -hmm. relative to that, right? Most yeah. of those losses end up being north of two, three million dollars when they're coming from top down. Yeah, yeah, um, no, good to know. Um, a few more questions, we'll try to go through these quicker. Uh, Russell says, does your hardware age out? If so, how often does it have to be replaced and at what cost? So our, our sensors have a they all have warranties, but our sensors have a seven-year battery life, at which point they would be replaced uh, at the building's cost. So it's a, obviously a revenue opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's not really a, it's not a limiting factor in terms of the sale uh, because it's a wireless sensor. It has to have battery replaced. That, that's the only reason why, why it would be failing because of the battery. Mm -hmm. and, and so the the links are, are hardwired in, the meters are hardwired in, so plugged into electrical. So we don't have that issue on the other products. Yeah, and even with respect to the sensors, we've got a pretty slick recycling program. And our expectation is by the time most of those sensors are coming to their near end use of life, A, we should have innovated within those five years and had something mm -hmm. to sell those, those yeah. customers to help them out. And B, right you know, we've got a way of being able to replace those sensors at a much lower cost, recycle them, which is much more responsible. And it's also easier for the customer because other comparable systems that you might be looking at with wireless sensors, they might have batteries, which guess who is responsible for replacing those batteries. It's mm -hmm. going to be the operator on site. And when it comes to them having to be responsible for it or us having to be responsible mm -hmm. for it, the answer is nine out of 10 times very clear that they prefer us to do it. Sure. Sure. It is, it is a great question. And, and, and then once we get those those sensors back, we replace the battery, re refurbish them, and can utilize them again. Oh, good to go. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, okay, Cocoon uh, asked, uh, any relationships with larger property management groups or, or, or REITs uh, interested in rolling it out in their existing uh, portfolios? I'll let, I'll let you... Yeah, no, definitely. When it comes to larger property management groups, I would say there's more property managers specifically are more of a, a challenge in terms of getting technology to proliferate because they're more of an, you know, an influencer within the space at the end of the mm -hmm. day, generally boards or owners on the other end, those REITs, uh, the, the real estate owners on the, on the back end who are more the decision makers. So we work with like a one great partner of ours would be uh, Fitzrovia as an example, who are uh, an offshoot of uh, Center Court. And Fitzrovia manages a, they're probably the largest uh, multifamily rental developer in Canada now, and they're a fairly mm -hmm. young company. Uh, you know, with them alone, we're proliferating their their whole sort of portfolio on the front end with new development. And these guys are bringing out Class B funds with now starting to retrofit and starting to implement there. So when it comes to, to folks along that side, we're, we're always looking to get more and more pervasive. Uh, but the bigger challenge, like Corey was mentioning, is a lot of the inventory is on retrofit and scaling mm -hmm. a program on retrofit where you're dealing with NOI implications and the cap rate of the asset means that it has to be a program that's either heavily capitalized or they have the bandwidth in the operating environment to not impact the cap rate of the asset by taking on more cost, or they have mm -hmm. mechanisms to pass it on to the occupants. And that's where some of our other relationships come into play with, you know, sub metering parties and, and other people who can avoid those NOI implications associated with the costs of running those facilities. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, Paul, a, a hardware as a service solution works there. It, yeah. it would be successful there. It's just we don't know to 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 what degree it would be successful. So right. that's something that we could test, but 
we're we're really laser focused on on building our core business in that course of construction and and retrofit that opportunity is going to be unlocking as insurance companies start giving the stick or the carrot more right which is going right. to happen yeah. yeah it's an even easier proposition if there's nothing up front and you're getting money back sure. from your insurance company and you're saving on yeah. your premiums which which oh, happens yeah. on the carrier yeah yeah I, yeah I, I mean I could see that happening there's so many so many organizations I, I keep thinking sort of the electrical industry or or the uh electric industry how there's incentive to either save or um you know be, be more uh, what's the word economical uh with with sort of devices and things like that so I could see the insurance companies getting to a point where they're incentivizing uh or deducting the costs uh for this sort of stuff um it's actually a funny thing, yeah. though, on that side, because yeah. when you're thinking about it from a human nature perspective, water represents by far and away the largest risk inside of these environments. Yeah. That would be like the insurance company saying, you need an incentive to wear your seatbelt in your car. Right. Right. right? And it's just <laughs> funny how human behavior works, because all of these environments pretty much have camera systems. They have fire suppression systems. And right. no one's going to ask the ROI on one of those systems. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's because this is something newer proliferating from the technology side, this should be just as much a table stake as those other two systems inside of the buildings. Yeah. And it's a matter of time and experience before it yeah. comes back. Yeah, no, good point, good point. Um, you touched on in your presentation competition, but maybe give us a, a little bit better idea of, uh, you know, who who are the competitors? What makes you different? Um, yeah, so, so there are, Dozens of smaller competitors. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll speak to the two largest competitors, which are Wint.ai and Alert Labs. Mm -hmm. And Wint is an is, is Israeli-based company. They're focused more on the ESG play. Mm -hmm. And Alert Labs is focused more on that retail office sector where they'll they'll ship sensors to a TD bank and and supply and install there. They're they're both in our industry as well, and we'll compete for the same customers. But I think our specialty really is this course of construction, multifamily residential space, and and uh, and and we've really mm -hmm. carved out a, a place for us there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, I, I think I know this question here or this answer rather, but um, are water leak sensors mandated by law uh, to be included in the construction of new buildings? No, the, but no we're seeing developers starting to include for them in the in, in the scope of work. So mm -hmm. the engineers are now pushing them and it often comes with the stick as Elliot mentioned, where yeah. they're being forced to do this. Yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, and then can these devices detect gas or smoke? I, I'm, I know it's just for water, but did, is there any other sort of opportunities to, to get a little more detection? <laughs> Well, maybe in, in uh, seven years when we're selling a new one, maybe that's a good uh, good <laughs> add-on. But these sensors can really, we could do anything sure. with them. Not, not today, but once you're placing that sensor, like, it, it has the ability to... Uh, I'd say anything. the greater likelihood is that we end up having a strategic partnership with an organization trying to solve that part of the problem utilizing some of our technology. Right, and I also, I also imagine the, the synergies around you. You're, you're monitoring the building to some degree already, and there may be some other things that you can end up monitoring using your your sort of your yeah. live system. So it, you never know what can happen. That, that's interesting. Or integrate with other systems as well. Exactly. Inside yeah. that more operational yeah. value. Where we've yeah. set up that network, which is expensive, and one day they're, these buildings are going to have IoT networks set up, and, and we've set up more IoT networks in Canada than any other vendor. Mm. I'd, so there's value in that network because you can bolt onto it, and and it's it's easy right. to uh, these developers to spend on it because they know they should be doing it. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, guess what? That's actually the last of the questions from uh, the listeners. Uh, I just got one question for you before we sort of wrap up, and it just what what's what's the biggest challenge you feel the business is facing right now, or or what sort of keeps you up at night? I. I'll go first. I I can't sleep, um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's really the service level is what keeps me up at night. We need to continue to perform the best in in the industry, and 
honor what we promise to our customers in terms of service. So it's all of these leak events, the, the four that I mentioned last night, I'm looking at them, like I'm getting these alerts real time, looking at them and just saying, what can we do to make sure that we've, we've provided the most value to this customer? Because mm -hmm. they're ultimately, the new customers are great, but our current customers are what's keeping the lights on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elliot, I, what, keeps, what keeps you up at night? I, I haven't uh, asked I, you that, Elliot. I'm, I'm uh, curious. <laughs> yeah, what keeps me up at night? You guys don't want to know. But... <laughs> It's mostly my dog barking. Um, no, actually, as it relates to this business, honestly, I, I I think that we have the best team in the marketplace. So I actually don't feel as much concerned about service levels because I know that that's our, our advantage across the board relative to everybody else because of how much we care and how much we know we're going to do the right thing, regardless of what the outcome is when talking to a customer. So that's not what concerns me. My, my bigger concern are the things that we can't control. Um, you know, the things outside of our span of control, the marketplace, interest rates, uh, what ends up happening structurally from a policy perspective when it comes to different, you know, municipalities, different provinces, different territories and states, uh, because that will likely be um, the thing that creates the most challenge across all of these markets for all of our stakeholders, right? Access to capital, access to lending, uh, construction loan rates, all of those sure. factors. So I'm I'm more concerned with the stuff that's outside of our span of control. The stuff that's within our span of control, I, I feel very confident in our in our team and our leadership. Because I'm losing sleep over it every night. Exactly, he gets <laughs> sleep, he doesn't sleep over that. That's right. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I, I'm not concerned with what we can't control. <laughs> the market's so new, and we're we're doing all the all lots the of opportunity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I gotcha. Um, Okay, so uh, you know we're we're investors. We're watching the business right now. What do you think of the key, maybe the key catalysts or maybe key metrics uh, from the business that we should should pay the I, most attention to? I our balance sheet uh, after this uh, private placement will look much much cleaner with with no debt. Uh, pay attention to cash flow from operations as well as our <laughs> revenue and deferred revenue are really the keys and and. Uh, yeah, we're 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 doing everything we can to uh, continue to grow and, and scale, and mm -hmm. we've cut costs to a level that we're very comfortable as an organization relative to where we were. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then, just last thing is uh, sort of open ended. Is there any anything that you think we we missed, or any key message you want to make sure everybody walks away with today? No, I, I think just following along the story, and, and this was amazing and, and really nice joining you, Paul and, and Trevor. And uh, yeah, so from my end, it's just continuing to follow along, add Eddie to your watch list. And uh, and yeah. Well, perfect. Well, we've been speaking with uh, President Corey Silver and Elliot. Uh, thanks for joining us, Elliot, uh, of Eddie's, um, sorry, Eddie Smart Home Solutions, EDY on the Venture Exchange. Guys, uh, it was a real pleasure to have you guys with us today and certainly look forward to, to following your progress and uh, hope to have you back uh, at some point uh, down, the, down the road here. Perfect. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Awesome. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.